Hello, a very warm welcome to the Stoke Mandeville Plastic Surgery webinar series. I'm James K.K. Chan. Three days ago was the World Lymphedema Day, and it was a stark reminder that lymphedema remains a massive medical and public health problem. Worldwide, 250 million people are afflicted by secondary lymphedema, and in developed nations where cancer treatment is the leading cause of lymphedema, it affects 15% of all cancer survivors and almost a third of breast cancer patients. As for primary lymphedema, this is also a big deal and is probably far more common than we think. The National Institutes of Health in the US estimates that as many as one in 300 live births are affected. So you can imagine how transformative it would be for humanity if we had an intervention that wasn't just effective but also widely available. Now today, we're extremely privileged and fortunate to have a very special guest with us. He is a plastic reconstructive surgeon who has spent a decade pushing this frontier. He's widely renowned as an innovator and leader in the field of lymphedema surgery. His name is Wei Chen, Professor of Plastic Surgery at the University of Iowa in the United States and co-director of one of the premier lymphedema centers worldwide at the Cleveland Clinic. So Wei, thank you very much for coming to join us today. And, uh, and you're in the operating room, I believe. Uh, yes, my case is about to start, but I, I'm going to come in and out uh, while we're prepping, while we're getting the patient uh, set up. Uh, while you play the, the lectures, the recorded lecture, and I'll be here for the live Q&A. That's great, thank you. So what I'll do now is um, I will share the, um, share the pre-recorded um, video. Uh, Hello everyone, how are you doing? Hope you're all doing well out there. Oh, this is Wei Chen from Cleveland. Pardon me, <laughs> let me go back. <laughs> Share the screen. Here we go. All right. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Hope you're all doing well out there. This is Wei Chen from Cleveland Clinic. I'm a professor of plastic surgery and I co-direct our lymphedema center here at Cleveland Clinic. Today I will talk to you about nine most common questions asked by microsurgeons about lymphatic surgery. I have no disclosure. These are all the procedures that we currently perform for lymphedema. We have preventive LVA or lymphatic venular anastomosis. This procedure is performed to treat asymptomatic lymphatic injury, preventing the patients from developing symptomatic disease. And then we have therapeutic LVA performed to treat symptomatic lymphedema. And then we have vascularized lymph vessel transfer, which is a derivative of lymph node transfer, the most, much better known uh, procedure. And so we have vascularized lymph vessel transfer, vascularized lymph node transfer, and then, of course, we have the debulking procedures, which is either performed with liposuction or with direct surgical excision, better known as the Charles procedure. So by now, I believe most people are familiar with the concept of the LVA, which basically involves connecting lymph channel to vein. So since there is an obstruction in the lymphatic system, therefore, we connect the lymph channels to vein hoping that the venous system will now take over the job of transporting lymph. Uh, and what's being demonstrated here is an example of an end to side anastomosis, connecting a 0.3 millimeter lymph vessel to a 0.9 millimeter vein. And it's uh, similar to microsurgery, just a lot smaller. Here you can see the sequence of suture placement is counterclockwise. And the three o'clock suture has already been placed. And now I was placing the 12 o'clock suture uh, using a 12 o suture. And we are at a, about 30 times mag. The background, uh, yellow background gives you scale uh, with each square being a millimeter. Now the 12 o'clock suture is done. 
Uh, we proceeded now with the nine o'clock suture. So once the anastomosis is completed, um, well, basically we determine the endpoint of suture. People usually ask, how many stitches do you place? Well, we continue to place sutures until we achieve a leak-proof anastomosis. In the interest of time, we won't watch the entire video. So, uh, as you can see, uh, the LVA procedure is minimally invasive. In the therapeutic LVA, we do make more cuts because we try to create more lymphatic drainage to treat a symptomatic disease. Whereas comparing to the prophylactic LVA, less incisions were performed, but in terms of how the procedures were performed in, ter in terms of the anastomotic techniques, therapeutic LVAs and prophylactic LVAs are basically the same. And then we have the limb vessel transfer. And currently, in addition to Dr. Koshima's first dorsal metatarsal artery limb vessel transfer, there are also the two limb vessel transfer proposed by us, um, which are basically skip based or TDAP based. So the principles are the same. Basically, we would harvest superficial to the scarpus or superficial fascia in order to preserve all of the lymph nodes, which are situated in the deep fat layer. And by doing so, we would harvest only the lymph channels that are present in the superficial fat and this is a vascularized transfer, so of course we need to transfer along with the tissue, artery, and veins, and then transfer them to the recipient site and reestablish the perfusion and venous drainage. And now these limb channels will start to function at the recipient site. The main advantage of this procedure when compared to the lymph node transfer is the appearance. Now we no longer have a bulge, we just have a flat patch. The scars are unfortunately still unavoidable, but the appearance is of course greatly improved when compared to lymph node transfer. I won't go into lymph node transfer because everybody's familiar with them. Uh, when it comes to lymph node transfer, out of fear for donor cell lymphedema, uh, plastic surgeons over time have explored various options and these are currently all the options that are available for lymph node transfer. You have Gron lymph node transfer, submental lateral thoracic, supraclavicular omentum, and jejunal mesenteric. Currently, omentum, at least in the United States, omentum lymph node transfer is the most popular lymph node transfer. My main problem with lymph node transfer is this. This is a comparison of the appearances from lymph node transfer and lymph vessel transfer. You can see which one you would prefer. Uh, although from my experience, lymph node transfer works also incredibly well. It's an excellent, powerful procedure. My issue with it is purely the appearance. Uh, I, I don't like the Rolex effect. Of course, we have the liposuction, and liposuction is the procedure of choice when the lymphedema is already solid predominant. When it's no, no longer a fluid disease. So power-assisted power assist liposuction is necessary because the lymphedema fat is quite fibrotic, and if you try to use your just your arm to perform the procedure, you would feel quite tired and possibly, uh, after several cases, injure your shoulder or your arm. Uh, and this is particularly the case if you try to treat patient with advanced lymphedema with dense fibrotic tissue. And therefore, power-assisted liposuction is very important. Now, uh, when we perform lymphedema liposuction, we prefer to remove skin excess. Of course, not everybody would need skin removal for those who demonstrate a positive flying squirrel sign which is defined as ability to traction the skin away from the deep fascia by four centimeters that is a positive flying squirrel sign and when the patient demonstrated a positive flying squirrel sign we recommend skin removal to decrease the risk of complications the risk of seroma hematoma uh, contour irregularity 
skin necrosis, so on and so forth. Uh, the performance of the skin reduction is fairly straightforward. It's basically the same as body contouring procedure. And when the skin is removed, you will see that uh, all of these complications are much, much less. And also, you don't need to use a drain because the death phase is greatly decreased. And these are, are fairly representative results. We can take someone looking like that down to someone looking like that. Even someone like this with early elephantiasis, instead of performing the disfiguring Charles procedure, try to offer liposuction, and usually you can still get a favorable result. Someone like this, arm is usually much less fibrotic compared to the legs, and therefore we can usually get even superior results for the arm when compared to the legs. Someone like this, and we can turn uh, the bulky arm into a skinny arm. Now the Charles procedure needs no further introduction or explanation. Uh, Charles procedure is a fairly old procedure. Basically we perform radical excision down to the deep fascia. There's the discussion about whether to also remove the deep fascia or not. Um, personally, I prefer the removal of the fascia. We'll leave it at that for now. If there's time, if people are interested, we can certainly discuss about it further. So putting it together, this is my algorithm. Going from stage zero disease, we treat with lympha. Stage zero disease is defined as lymphatic injury without symptoms. So a lot of people also don't like the name lympha because they feel that it's really not prophylactic. There's already injury. So Many people prefer the name immediate lymphatic reconstruction. For fluid predominant disease, I treat mostly with LVA. LVA is a lot more powerful than a lot of people, a lot of people giving it credit for. And um, I really reserve the transfer procedure only in the late, late fluid predominant disease. And in my practice, I no longer perform lymph node transfer, even though I'm still leaving it leaving it on my algorithm. Um, I treat flu predominant disease mostly with LVA and in the most, most advanced injury, I would treat with uh, lymph vessel transfer. When the patient uh, demonstrates a solid predominant disease, that's when I treat with liposuction. Following liposuction, the patient can then go back and receive reconstruction represented by these arrows. And of course, Charles' procedure for the fulminant disease. Now, uh, well, what I have circled here represents the hybrid treatment. The hybrid treatment does it as debulking first and then reconstruction later. There's some controversy about the sequence. I understand some surgeons prefer reconstruction first and then debulking later. Now, we will start to go into the questions. I've summarized nine questions that I get asked most frequently when I, based on uh, my experience in giving these lectures about lymphedema surgery. Question one, does lymphedema surgery work? It absolutely does. That is the short answer. So, uh, of course, we can go in and discuss about all the data and evidence. The short answer is it does work. So, when I say this, usually I will have... Um, People asking me that they've tried LVA or lymph node transfer on some patient and it didn't work, or some patient would come to me and said they have had LVA or liposuction, some procedure done, lymphedema surgery done and didn't work. The analogy that I usually give them is uh, if you, this is Jiro. Uh, I think most people know about uh, Master Jiro. Ono, uh, who's nicknamed the god of sushi. If you ate sushi made by Jiro-san, of course, you're going to think that sushi is the best tasting food in the world. Well, wait until you try sushi made by me. You're going to have a very different conclusion. So who is right? Uh, well, that, I think sushi can be incredibly delicious or it can be gross depending on who made it. Uh, I think when it comes to surgery, it's the same thing. Uh, I think as a surgeon, in general, we should have the humility to, first of all, whenever we try a procedure and it didn't work out the way we want, 
instead of concluding that the surgery didn't work, first of all, ask ourselves, is it ourselves or is it the procedure? So uh, I've been doing lymphedema surgery for 10 years now. And um, uh, recently we've been doing our four year review and this is what we have done. Uh, I'm going to quickly share some of the data with you. So altogether, we have 591 cases. They're mostly, um, for the reconstructive procedure, mostly LVA. We also did a good amount of liposuction. Lymph vessel transfer represented the smallest uh, uh, group. And we did not perform any lymph node transfer in the past four years. And how did we assess our surgical outcomes? We assess, uh, of course, the size of the limbs. We assess their function, their quality of life, bioimpedance, which measures the amount of fluid in the arm or leg. And the most important tracking modality for us is the endosigning green lymphography, which produce uh, results that are reproducible and longitudinally uh, comparable. And very importantly, patients subject to feeling uh, short-term patient subjective report is not reliable because they are biased. The long term, they actually are quite reliable and we found that they correlate with ICG lymphography quite well. And using these outcome measures, the, these are basically our outcomes. So as you can see, they're all quite favorable uh, in terms of patient subjective improvement, decrease in lymph volumes and improvement seen on ICG decrease in infection, improvement in quality of life. I'm going to direct your attention to the last two. First of all, no symptoms and patient has stopped using compression. Essentially, they have such thorough reversal of their pathology that they no longer display any lymphedema symptoms and they have stopped wearing compression garment. So this is achievable, even though it's only achievable in small percentage of our patient, only 18%. And last but not the least, this is actually very important that all of our patients, every single one of them, all, uh, let's see how many of them, uh, 591 of them were happy and feeling now hopeful about the future of their lymphedema management. This is what we feel to be very important, the ability to bring hope and happiness to our patient. Question two, um, when to do which procedure? So I have already somewhat gone over this, but I will go over our algorithm in somewhat greater details now. Uh, initially, we need to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, most frequently, lymphedema patients came with a clinical diagnosis. They haven't had any imaging studies or any confirmatory study to confirm the diagnosis. So it is incredibly important that we confirm the diagnosis before we operate on the patient for obvious reason. It's not uncommon that I saw patients who were either uh, uh, diagnosed with lymphedema when they didn't have lymphedema or they actually uh, had lymphedema but were diagnosed with something else. Basically they had false negatives and false positives. And then once the diagnosis of lymphedema is confirmed with ICG lymphography, then you need to determine whether they have solid or fluid predominant disease. Usually with sufficient experience, just looking at the patient, performing a physical exam, you would know already whether you're looking at a solid or fluid predominant disease. But if you need additional confirmatory data, you can perform bioimpedance or you can perform an MRI that will give you additional information. Now, uh, for fluid predominant patient, we treat with either LVA or lymph vessel transfer. If you prefer, lymph node transfer is also considered acceptable. For patient with solid predominant disease, we treat with the bulking procedure first. That would be either liposuction, for the most part, for patient with fulminant elephantiasis, when there is such severe fibrosis that the, the soft tissues are no longer coming out with liposuction. And at this point, of course, you would need to resort to radical excision. But great majority of the patients are treatable with liposuction. And depending on whether they have a positive flying squirrel sign, we decide whether they get skin removal or not. Now, after the 
the bulking procedure, all of the patients uh, would become candidates for reconstruction. When it comes to reconstruction, uh, we perform mostly LEA. And as you see increasing severity of pathology, then you start to consider the possibility of performing limb vessel transfer instead of LVA. Now note that LVA would continue to work even in advanced fluid predominant disease, showing lots of diffuse pattern, although relatively speaking, they start to work less. And in my opinion, that's when the limb vessel transfer procedure should be considered along with LVA. So next question. Now, if you're interested in starting uh, lymphedema surgery, you will wonder, uh, do you really need these fancy microscope instruments? Now, uh, so the rainbow instruments or ME uh, instruments, uh, these are the titanium instruments that uh, are designed for super microsurgery in comparison to regular microsurgery forceps. Actually, these are not regular microsurgery forceps. These are ladies' eyebrow tweezers, although they are identical when I compare them under the microscope. The ladies' eyebrow tweezers are actually identical to uh, our standard microsurgery forceps. So do you really need these titanium super microsurgery instruments compared to uh, this eyebrow tweezer set that I purchased from Amazon for $15? Uh, for instrument, actually, you do, because they make a huge difference. Specialized super microsurgery instruments make a huge difference. My recommendation is to not do super microsurgery with standard microsurgery instruments, even when they are labeled as super fine. The standard microsurgery instruments, forceps, for example, have tips that measure 0.3 millimeters. Many of the so-called superfine forceps have tips that measure 0.1 millimeters. Now, when you compare to the dedicated super microsurgery forceps, their tips are 0.05 millimeters or 50 micron. So this is uh, substantially smaller compared to the standard microsurgery forceps or 0.3 millimeters. Most of the LVAs would fall into the range of 0.2 to 0.6 millimeters. And you can imagine how difficult it would be if you try to handle a 0.2 millimeter vessels with a forcep, uh, forceps with tips measuring 0.3 millimeters. So if you've been doing super microsurgery with microsurgery instruments, you would realize you all of a sudden become so much better. And I'm speaking from personal experience because I didn't start out using uh, super microsurgery instruments. So start out the right way, just get the proper instruments. Now, when it comes to the microscope, uh, it is somewhat of a different story. This is what I used to use. Uh, now, I, I shouldn't name names. Uh, I think most of you recognize the microscope. This is a very powerful microscope, and it's what I used to use. And now I have moved up to even better microscope. Again, uh, no names here, but I, I think you know what scope this is. Uh, this is, again, excellent scope, excellent optics. Uh, you can see very well uh, uh, with this microscope. But the thing is, when I travel, and also uh, Cleveland Clinic is quite big, uh, we have uh, multiple hospitals, including many regional centers. When I go to regional centers, and also when I travel abroad to do live surgery, this is what I frequently end up with. Uh, so this is also fine, uh, actually, Contrary to, to the popular saying, uh, you don't need a fancy microscope to do super microsurgery. So my recommendation on the microscope is, uh, well, first of all, the regular surgical, uh, the regular microsurgery microscopes mostly have applications that are uh, lower than 20 times, most frequently 17 to, to 18 times. Um, for Super micro LVA, particularly if you are starting out, it is best to have more power. And my recommendation would be about 30 times, just so you can see everything clearly. And if you're making a decision about microscope purchase, remember that resolution is more important than application. And 
once you become experienced, you will find that your requirement for modification quickly drops. And actually, I now feel more comfortable with lower modification just because I, I get a broader feel. And frequently, uh, 18 to 19 times uh, magnification is sufficient. Question four, how do I train for super microsurgery? Well, first of all, don't train on the patients. When you train on the patients, first of all, patients get hurt. Uh, they sustain a bad outcome. And when you, as a surgeon, you sustain bad outcome, it will damage your confidence on these procedures, and then it will damage your interest, your enthusiasm on perform these, these procedures to help uh, lymphedema patients. So don't train on the patients. enjoy the music while I take a sip of my coffee. The message here is clear. Uh, use the chicken thigh simulation model. With this model, we have successfully trained myself and uh, many super microsurgeons. Um, so the training sequence, uh, first of all, you need to equip yourself with a super micro ruler. Uh, again, no names here. Happy to share the, the vendor uh, in private. It's basically a steel ruler uh, that is used to measure cracks in cement. And it's appear in many publications. If you look, look it up, uh, you'll find it. Um, the reason you need that ruler is most frequently, uh, microsurgeons don't really measure how big or small the vessels are. And if you use that paper ruler that usually comes with a surgical marking pen, you're not going to get accurate okay. measurement. Okay. So you need that super micro ruler. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, I'm still here, and it looks like uh, there's something wrong with the video. Oh, right. You know what? I can present live. Uh, yeah, I'm only hearing audio. And let's see. So apologies to the audience. Uh, if you allow me to share screen, I can present live. What, what was the, um, what was it? hung up or something no no the video is not advancing the video is frozen it's just oh, okay. we're only getting audio right okay so um you should be able to share screen now i think okay all right well my apologies to everybody give me a few seconds to pull up the talk and all right here we go can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Let me find. Right, I'll need to talk a little bit faster to pick up the lost time. I think we lost we lost a tear. Okay. My Thanks take on much. the microscope. All right. Uh, so, as I said, you don't need a fancy microscope. Although starting out, if you can, uh, if you can um, get a nicer microscope, if you can get between uh, high twenties to low thirties, that would be the best for people who are starting out, because you would feel more comfortable. Um, you will feel more comfortable seeing the lumens. Um, well, hopefully I don't get into trouble. Okay, there you go. Um, so resolution, as I said, is more important than notification. And once you become experienced, you'll find that you would appreciate being able to see more. And therefore, a lower MAC giving you a larger feel is actually preferred. So most of the standard microsurgery microscope would give you uh, high teens from 15 to 17 or so, that's the most common. 
So even the regular microscope once you're experienced uh, would be sufficient. Next question is, how do I train for super microsurgery? And my main tip is to don't train on patients because training on patients will give you bad results. And that will in terms discourage you and discourage people from trying lymphatic surgery from continuing to offer these procedures. So how do we train? Well, we train outside of the operating room using simulation models and uh, well, I guess I won't play the rubber chicken Star Wars. Uh, that's something that I'm working on recently. How do you play the rubber chicken? Is, uh, well, if you're interested, you can look that up uh, yourself. It's it's a <laughs> it's a unique talent and unique skill set. Uh, anyway, so uh, the chicken thigh simulation model is is great, and you can find the full range of super microsurgery uh, vessels from 0.1 to 0.8 millimeters. So you can tailor the training to your own level. And uh, it's the best simulation model that we've used. Uh, so in terms of the training sequence, well, first of all, you need to get a ruler, a super micro ruler. And so far the most commonly used is the, uh, well, I'll just let you know the Xinhua uh, crack scale. So this is actually not a surgical instrument. It's a construction instrument used to measure cracks in cement, but uh, it's it's precise and it allows you to clearly measure down to 0.1 millimeters. So conventionally, when microsurgeons perform microsurgery, we don't really know how small the vessels are. We just know that they're small. And but actually, most frequently, they're not that small. The standard microsurgery uh, for example, ALT deep flap, these are vessels uh, ranging two millimeters to 2.5 millimeters or so. They're fairly large. So you need to know exactly what you're working on. So uh, you need a, a super micro ruler. And it's fine. So you want to start out with uh, a low hanging fruit, which is one millimeter vessel. Uh, and once you achieve a 10 out of 10 success, then you're ready to move on. The next milestone would be the 0.8 millimeters. And again, once you achieve success, you can move on to a smaller target. Uh, 0.5 is where I feel that for, for beginning super microsurgeon, that's when the challenge would start. Larger than 0.5, that really feels fairly similar to the feel of a standard microsurgery. And people talk about tactile feedback. There's no tactile feedback at this level for super microsurgery. It's purely visual. So no tactile feedback and um, uh, you need to get used to that environment. So that's why uh, when people say my super microsurgery or just smaller microsurgery, I don't quite agree because the skill sets are quite different. And um, once you can, once you're comfortable with 0.5 millimeters, then start to go smaller. Each 0.1 millimeter increment decrease is a significant jump in in uh, technical level. So it does take further training. And when you reach 0.1 millimeter, then congratulations, you are among the top super microsurgeons in the world. As far as I know, uh, no one has gone smaller than 0.1. Uh, I think you can check with Dr. Koshima. He is already working on something called nano microsurgery, uh, which is uh, for now he's defining as anything less than 0.2 millimeters. And um, yeah, but I'm pretty sure that we will go smaller. It's only a matter of time. All right, question six, how do you stop, uh, how to stop damaging or replacing your super micro instrument? I just said before, it's highly recommended that you get dedicate a super microsurgery instrument and if you keep on damaging them which is a, a huge problem for I think most people starting super microsurgery they uh, found this to be quite problematic your practice won't be sustainable so this is probably the most valuable slide that I'm sharing with you here so first and foremost before you even get your hands on these instruments you need to talk to your instrument processing people and also tell them that forget about repairing these instruments. I mean, many of them are used to repairing microsurgery instruments. When they're bent, they repair them. These instruments are not serviceable. If they're damaged, they're gone. 
forget about repairing them. They never got it right. So it's more important, put your emphasis, focus on prevention of damage. And you want to institute checkpoints before and after surgery, before and after washing, before and after placing them, uh, preparing, place, placing them back into the case, preparing for the surgery. So you can identify for your institution at what time point are these instruments damaged and then you can fix it. From our experience, these instruments tend to get damaged while they're being transported, when they're being placed back into the case or when they're being removed from the case, uh, when they're being washed, not when they're being sterilized. So once they're in the protective case, they're protected. So um, uh, it's important that you need uh, to have a case that immobilized the instruments, just simply from having the instruments gliding around in the case, banging against the wall, that's enough to ruin the instruments. And you want to have people who are designated to handle, to process these instruments. Uh, incredibly important. So this is the customized um, case that we came up for these instruments. And spending the money to build a case like this would save you so much money. Um, the cost of one instrument will build so many of these cases, so definitely invest to build a case like this that immobilize all, every single piece of the instruments. All right, question seven. I'm going to try to speed up a bit. Uh, how to start lymphedema surgery service? This is pretty easy. I, I think if you talk to the hospital leadership, the administration, they can easily see that this is going to be a signature or a halo program for the institution, for the hospital. It would be helpful to the hospital's reputation and it would also boost related services. For example, all the oncologic services will get a boost as a result of your presence uh, by having a lymphedema reconstruction service. Nowadays, patients are, are very savvy. They would look you up, look up your hospital, look up your service before they even come in. And we know that patient will choose you as a result of your ability to perform uh, advanced reconstruction of the breast or of lymphedema. And of course that translates into increased revenue. So it's pretty easy to uh, get the hospital leadership and administration to, to sign on uh, with this project. And once you get your uh, uh, internal team in place, you want to get the word out and that's best done by giving talks well not in a talk like this because uh, we're all plastic surgeons microsurgeons and you won't be referring patients in england to me uh, just like patients coming to me i will go ahead and help them i most likely uh, won't refer my patient to you happy to refer uh, patients to you if patient from england uh, uh, reached out to us uh, but in general, to get the word out, you want to talk to people who are non-microsurgeons, talk to your allied medical professionals, talk to other surgeons, oncologic surgeons, therapists, vascular surgeons. They see a lot of these patients, but they are powerless to help them. They don't know what to do. So uh, this would be a win-win situation for you and for them. Uh, this would be an example of how a uh, large patient advocacy group partner with us. And uh, this post was just made by this group uh, a few days ago that, uh, so the group has, um, I believe more than 6,000 members or something like this is incredibly helpful in terms of promoting your service. Question eight, how do you get paid? Another very important question. So the two sources of how you get paid, one is insurance, the other is patient with self-pay. I know your system is somewhat different. I'll share our experience with um, both insurance and self-pay. So when it comes to insurance coverage, it is quite challenging. And as a result of the reasons listed here, uh, first of all, there are no standardized procedure codes. And also they're frequently being labeled by insurance carriers as investigational. Well, it's investigational maybe in 20th century, we're in 21st century now. So. Uh, that's really not an appropriate label. But what gives them the chance to say that? Well, because if you look at the literature, the outcomes are all over the place. Why are the outcomes all over the place? I've already given you the analogy of Jiro Sushi and my sushi. 
Uh, if you taste both, you can easily tell the difference. And so I think we lymphedema surgeons, microsurgeons, super microsurgeons need to come to a consensus. We need to have a uniform voice. If we continue to, to um, have comments all over the place, that gives insurance carriers the opportunity to say, these are investigational, these procedures don't work, and therefore coverage will be difficult. And when coverage is difficult, surgeons won't want to uh, devote their practice to, look, to helping lymphedema patients. Cell pay, um, this can work, and this, in my opinion, should be the last resort because cell pay puts a lot of burden on the financial burden on the patients, and you would end up catering only to rich lymphedema patients. So I think as much as we can, we should try to get the patient covered by insurance. But if, um, if in your institution, if the insurance coverage won't work out, you do what you have to do. I think if you charge an arm and the leg for your procedure, it's still better than not helping. We really need more lymphedema patients. There are not enough lymphedema patients, uh, surgeons. Too many patients, not enough surgeons. Last question, is lymphedema curable? I, I thought long and hard whether I'm going to put this in there uh, because I know it's, it's very controversial, but what the heck, I, I think we should report as is as a uh, surgeon scientist. So lymphedema is curable as I have reported uh, earlier in our four year series, we are achieving 18% uh, uh, cure rate uh, actually, I observed my first case of cure back in 2012 with a lymph node transfer. And since then, I've seen it in LVA, I've seen it in, in lymph vessel transfer. So for people who disagree with the term cure, I'm happy to use any other term to describe the state in which the patient no longer display any lymphedema symptoms and they no longer require compression. If people don't like the term cure, I'm happy to use any other term. But essentially, this is the state that we are achieving in a small percentage of patients. In the interest of time, I won't play this testimonial. This is uh, one of the cases of cure. This patient uh, had LVA and she was one year out. She no longer displayed any symptoms and she stopped wearing compression garments. And she also looked excellent on her ICG lymphography. As you can see, uh, this is pre-op and this is her uh, two-year post-op. She gained some weight, and, but you can see the near complete reversal. There's still some residual stardust, but bulk of the stardust pattern has resolved. That's all I have, and I want to leave time for questions. That's great. Thank you so much, um, Wei. A really succinct um, you know, summary of the cutting-edge concepts of lymphedema. Do you mind just um, unsharing your screen for a second so people can see your face clearer? <laughs> And um, we have a number of questions that have come through, um, but I wanted to start off um, by asking you um, about this, which is you've done something which is um, extremely courageous. You've dedicated much of your career to something that, you know, as you say, some of insurance companies and healthcare systems term investigational. So can you tell us a bit, how, uh, a bit about how you got into the field of lymphedema and why you were so convinced at the outset that it was a winner. I, I, I don't know how many of you uh, are martial artists. Uh, so I'm the martial artist, uh, well, former. <laughs> uh, so I started training in martial art as a kid. And in martial art, uh, when you first started, your goal was probably to be as good as your senior and uh, become a black belt, but once you become a black belt, you start to your first dan, and you your next goal is you want to be a second dan, third dan, and you want to be like your master, and so on and so forth. It, it's a never-ending quest of self betterment, and I think as a surgeon, we we're on that quest. Uh, when we were a medical student, we look up to our teachers, our mentors, and then um, you keep on pursuing excellence. So I think for, for me, uh, microsurgery was what, what fascinated me as a medical student. And I found out in order to become a microsurgeon, you need to be a plastic surgeon first. 
So then I picked plastic surgery. And um, then I chose uh, Chang'an to do my microsurgery training, which uh, was one of the best decisions I made. Um, and, but then uh, I realized there is something called super microsurgery that goes even smaller. So then I, I have to, I have to learn it. Uh, so, I mean, it really started, uh, when I started offering lymphedema surgery, as I said, initially I only offered lymph no transfer. And I always told the patient, there is another procedure called LVA, but I was taught that it, it doesn't work. You should get lymph node transfer. It never sat right with me. I, I feel that if I were going to say something like that, I need to be not only be able to perform both procedures, I need to be good with both procedures. Then I can present to my patient uh, with a more balanced view. So that, that was what got me started. And then once I got trained in lymphatic surgery, I realized I was one of the few uh, in US and patients started coming to me. So it, it partially it's, it just kind of happened. It wasn't uh, by design or plan. Well, thank you for that. So your the center, the Cleveland Clinic, is clearly very well established. It's got a large throughput of cases. You showed us almost 604 years. Can you just give us an idea of the kind of breakdown of um, cases? What were the causes of lymphedema, and um, and how many of these referrals do you actually operate on? What are your inclusion and exclusion criteria? Uh, so, essentially all patients, patients of all lymphedema severities are surgical candidates. Now we're excluding the ones who are medically unfit. Let's say BMI of 60, you're not going to operate someone like that. But mild lymphedema or severe lymphedema, they're not going to be excluded as a surgical candidate because of their, their lymphedema severity, whether it's too mild or too advanced. Regardless of the lymphedema severity, there is a procedure that's appropriate for them. Also, I disagree with the saying that surgery is second line treatment. It is very common that you hear people saying lymphedema therapy should be first line and surgery should be second line. Why is that? If we are offering lymphedema surgery to patients who don't even have symptoms to prevent symptomatic disease, what do you have to reject a patient who already are symptomatic coming to you and say, I want surgery? The thing is, I consider both lymphedema therapy and surgery first line treatment. I think lymphedema therapy is certainly very important. There, it's just different. These are two different treatment options with different pros and cons, and both should be presented equally to the patient and involve the patient in treatment. In, in treatment planning process. Someone who is 70 year old with uh, a stage two lymphedema may be treated very differently than a two year old, an infant with an entire lifespan ahead of him or her with lots of time for the disease to progress. So uh, yeah, that's, that's my take. Of course, there are different opinions out there. And in terms of the breakdown of, you know, which body parts or what the primary pathology is, can you tell us a bit about that? So what we have found is, is that primary lymphedema is not rare. That's another myth that we frequently hear. Uh, primary lymphedema is rare. It's not rare. Actually, in my practice, it's about 40 to 50 percent. Almost half of the patients have primary. Uh, the thing is, they're frequently misdiagnosed as secondary. For example, you hear a patient coming to you saying, I was bitten by mosquito, then I developed lymphedema. That's a primary. Mosquito isn't that powerful to damage your lymphatic system. Or I sprained my ankle, then I developed lymphedema. Or I had a knee replacement and the orthopedic surgeon damaged my lymphatics, so I have lymphedema. All of those, when I hear a story like that, and even something more esoteric, uh, someone got stuck by cactus, uh, diagnosed with secondary lymphedema. Uh, I had a, had a gentleman who had a fight with wife and was slapped on the face, developed uh, head and neck lymphedema, and as a result of 
his wife slapping him. Uh, he came to me with a diagnosis of acquired lymphedema. I, I told him, of course, that's not acquired lymphedema. That's primary lymphedema. And both of them started crying, and the wife was so relieved. Um, so primary lymphedema is quite common. And um, the breakdown of arm and leg, other body parts, they're all very common. Uh, uh, it's not really that arms are more common. Uh, legs are, I think, just as common as arm lymphedema. And and um, breakdown of adults and kids. Do you, do you do one of the um, audience members is asking about your experience with kids? So these procedures work in kids, and the diagnostic tests work in kids also. Relatively speaking, we do have significantly less pediatric patients than adult, and I think that's due to a uh, lack of information. The patients not knowing that the parents not knowing that these treatments exist. So we really need to get the word out, raise awareness. That's why we're doing this webinar right now to raise awareness. Each one of you now has additional information that you may agree or disagree. Um, but uh, relatively speaking, we do have less pediatric uh, patients. So these procedures, based on our observations so far, do work equally in kids. Great. Another question from the audience. What extra training is needed for the extended team? So for your scrub team and your therapists and so on, what kind of educational program do you, do you give? There's really no significant additional training. I, I think the scrub people, the scrub nurses, circulators, uh, there's not a whole lot of additional training. The additional training really should be on the instrument processing people. If they keep on breaking your instruments, you won't go very far. <laughs> Okay, um, so lymphedema surgery is clearly you know, a combination of technical mastery, but also very complex decision-making. Um, and it, for me, it's pretty miraculous, and I'm sure to many of the audience, that connecting a small number of lymph vessels that are sub-millimeter in size can improve the swelling so dramatically. Um, so how many, is there a minimum number you do? Does it matter? Um, is that dependent on the size of the vessels that you see? Can you talk to us about that? So, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a great question. I'm glad that you remind me to go over that. So, uh, so different procedure has different technical consideration, uh, but uh, we're on LVA, we'll just talk about LVA now. So when it comes to LVA, I, I think uh, many of us, uh, we're all initially fascinated by how small these vessels are and the ability to connect them together. So uh, many surgeons stop at that point. They're so focused on the anastomosis itself. And as a result, frequently when patients come to me or surgeons come to me saying, I tried LV, it didn't work. Why is that? Uh, when we look at how the LVA was done, Getting the anastomosis to work, getting a patent anastomosis is really just the first step. Frequently, the surgery, the surgery didn't work as a result of inappropriate patient selection. That, that's the most common cause, why the LVA didn't work. The second, it's not just about getting a limb vessel to connect to your vein with patent anastomosis. It's about getting integrate flow. You want limb vessel to vein flow. So in order to get that flow, you need to have a favorable pressure gradient, which is not always possible. So in a given incision, you see, let's say two veins, and then you see three or four limb vessels. How do you get them together in order to create integrate flow? There's a lot of discussion, end to side, side to end, side to side, lambda, whatever. I mean, that's really another lecture. How to generate integrate flow um, but what we see most commonly is people do end-to-end -end anastomosis. End-to-end -end anastomosis would only work if you have your lymphatic press pressure greatly exceeding the venous pressure. Whenever you have an unfavorable pressure gradient, your end-to-end -end anastomosis will end up shutting down and not working. So these are two most common causes that I see why people's LVAs didn't work out. And then that... Uh, People resort to lymph node transfer. 
uh, not surprisingly, lymphatonal transfer is a concept that's already familiar to us. It's a free flop. Uh, so that's that's what I see. Yeah, and and the number of um, LVAs that you do. So the, the number, there's really no single magic number because, and you can easily see why that is because it's it's quality and quantity. If you have one very strong LVA, and there's a video that I show frequently of what a strong LVA looks like, it's just rigorously pumping lymph into the vein. If you get one like that, that surgery would already work. Versus if you have, all you see are these very weak um, all lymph vessels that have lost its peristaltic activity, then you know these LVAs are going to be passive conduits and they will require external compression to help you drive uh, the lymph flow to generate that pressure gradient. When you see that your lymph vessels are compromised like that, you may want to compensate for lack of quality with quantity. So there's no magic number. It really, it's really case by case. And as you can imagine, something like this will be extremely difficult to study because there are just too many variables involved. Sure. But on a practical note, do you book the patients in for a three hour period and do as much as you can during that time? How, how do you approach that? I can tell you that you do develop a feel that is not scientific of how much is enough after you've done enough number of LVA, you do develop a feel. I mean, this is, this is like, uh, I'm sure many of you experienced microsurgeons in the audience, once you have done an anastomosis, you don't do your patency check. You know it's good or you know it's bad. You develop that unscientific feel. Um, the same thing here. After having done enough, you know that this is enough. But on a practical standpoint, I can share with you my progression. When I started that, I believe more is better. So I would keep going until I was about to pass out out of dehydration <laughs> and, and hypoglycemia. And that means I would be in the operating room for 12, 14 hours. That's how long my LVA would take. And then I got faster and faster. Uh, and I would spend 10 hours and I routinely get 20 to 30 LVAs done. And one day I went out to a meeting. I realized everybody did three and call it a day. I was like, whoa, I can be done in, in, in one hour <laughs> or two hours. Uh, so I realized uh, patients probably don't need 30 LVA, so I should cut my operative time in half. So then I cut my operative time down to five hours, and I haven't seen any uh, adverse effect from that. And since then, I've become even faster. So now my LVA is, is about four hours. Um, and, and usually uh, by four hours, I, I, it's quite repetitious. Uh, you kind of feel like it's, it's time to move on to the next case. <laughs> and so now my LVA is about four hours. And again, uh, fortunately, I haven't seen any adverse effect. They seem to work just as well. Uh, compared to when I was doing uh, 20, 30 LVAs. Brilliant. And, and you mentioned that, you know, almost a fifth of your patients have what you, you might consider a cure, where they are, you know, they have no more swelling, they're not wearing the sleeve anymore. Um, but for the majority of patients, they don't quite achieve that. Can you give us an idea of what sort of volume reduction we're talking about? And do you have an idea of the minimum volume reduction that's patients will feel would be meaningful? I would advise people don't track their outcome based on volume reduction. We're so stuck on volume reduction. If mm -hmm. you talk to many patients, that's not what bothers them the most. What bothers them the most are pain, discomfort, rigidity, frequently nerve compression symptoms. And, um, and also, as I said, if the patient already has solid predominant disease with lots of lymphedema induced lipodystrophy and you perform an LVA, you're not gonna see or lymph no transfer. You're, gonna, you're not gonna see a notable volume reduction because that's not what the procedure is designed for. Uh, if you perform lymph no transfer, lymph vessel transfer LVA in someone who is fluid predominant, yes, you will see a significant volume reduction. But most of the patient have 
either mixed disease or solid predominant disease. You would need to see the patient at the right time to catch fluid predominant phase. So tracking the outcome using volume is flawed. Uh, that's why multimodal tracking is needed. You, you need, yes, you do need volume tracking, but you also should track uh, quality of life or function. They would tell you, I used to need to wear a class four garment, and now I can just wear a class two. That's 40 to 50 millimeter mercury compared to now they're just wearing 20 millimeter mercury. That's almost like putting on socks. So that dramatic improvement in in um, in function in quality of life, they could be having infection continuously and taking suppressive antibiotic, and now they're able to stop taking antibiotic and not get any further infection. Those are much more meaningful outcome than just size of the arm or leg. Great. Well, that's very clear. I mean, the uh, lymphedema surgery is clearly a blossoming field. You know, you've you've made a very strong case for that, and you've sh shared with us um, some fantastic results. But as you mentioned, some people still feel is investigational, and you can understand. You know, in some countries, many countries like the UK, um, where we have a public healthcare system, and insurance companies are going to be understandably slightly hesitant to commit billions of pounds or dollars to this kind of surgery, where you know the evidence base. Uh, for a blossoming field like this is obviously going to be consisting largely of retrospective non-comparator um, comparison um, um, studies um, and observation and studies with short outcomes. Do you think now there are more lymphedema surgeons around, the field is, you know, is, is ripe for a randomized control study to answer this question once and for all? Uh, actually, I, I think my personal opinion, not just lymphedema surgery, any surgical procedure doesn't lend itself well to randomized control. Because whenever, whenever you have multiple surgeons in a study, that's a confounding factor. Um, the same procedure in the hands of different surgeons are not the same procedure. Even something as straightforward as, say, a breast augmentation. There are just so many steps, so many technical details that we do it differently. So when you get a different outcome, it's hard to say, you can't just draw a conclusion on the procedure itself. So I, I think in general, surgery doesn't lend itself as well to randomized control as say a medication. A medication is the same medication regardless of who prescribed the medication. That's just not the nature of surgery. <clears throat> so it will be difficult to study lymphedema surgery and randomized control. But certainly I think we can gradually reach a consensus and these consensi are gradually forming and merging um, as people meet and debate about various topics uh, over the years. There are certainly still lots of controversies, um, but um, I, it is my sincere hope that more people join us in helping this patient population. Uh, this is an underserved uh, patient population. And as I mentioned, putting the results aside, these patients are grateful and they are happy that you at least are trying to help them. It's almost regardless of the results, uh, even if you are not that successful technically, the fact that you understand what they're going through, you're trying to help them uh, would make them very grateful. So th this is a very gratifying feel. Great. Thank you very much. I think you know that's a fantastic way to end this. Uh, there are a few questions about the technical aspects of the surgery, but I think um, you already have lots of videos on YouTube um, available that discuss all those aspects. Um, so. Thank you so much once again for your time and joining us. Thank um, you, James. Great. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Have a good day in the OR. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.